um, you know, in uh, 1975 when I left the, I think this is too loud. Uh, when I left the uh, NIH, I knew two things. One is that I uh, wanted to have a career that would give me the opportunity to have the thrill from some discoveries in the laboratory. And the other is I decided I really wanted to uh, help patients who had skin disease. Now, the problem at that time was that there were only Oh, there were no genes or proteins that were known to be important in skin disease except for the collagens and, and the tyrosinase that causes pigmentation. No genes, no proteins. And so there was a lot to learn. Um, and I'm going to tell you today about some of the things I learned and how a lot of these important things paralleled uh, important things for the foundation for ichthyosis and related skin types. And these are the topics that I will cover. Uh, and they're obviously been very important to me, and I think many of them are, are very <coughs> relevant and important to the ichthyosis community. So I'm going to start with retinoids. Um, <clears throat> because in 1975, Gary Peck for, published the first uh, trial of uh, using isotretinoin uh, which was called Accutane in those days, to treat ichthyosis. And Hoffman and Roach was busy recruiting uh, sites for <clears throat> multi-center trial. Uh, and I knew somebody at Roach at the time and asked if she would send some people to Yale whether we could do the study, and in fact we did. So along with my dermatology mentor, Joe McGuire, and we started seeing patients in 1977 uh, for part of that multi-center trial of uh, Accutane for ichthyosis. And very quickly, we saw some pretty dramatic results. Um, this is a young man with lamellar ichthyosis and uh, an, an adult who has epidermolytic ichthyosis. Uh, and for virtually all these people, uh, there was rapid removal of scale. Uh, many of them noticed that they had <clears throat> less itching. They certainly were spending less time grooming themselves in the, the tub and with emollients. Uh, some began to sweat for the first time. And a few actually uh, had a reduction in their erythema as well. Uh, and the interesting part of this slide is that this, this young lady uh, had been diagnosed at five months of age uh, with neonatal psoriasis and uh, by Sid Hurwitz, a famous pediatric dermatologist. Um, but when I took care of him as a, her as a resident in the hospital, uh, we changed, decided to change the diagnosis to pityriasis ruba pilaris. This is what I treated her as for 40 years uh, until uh, 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 Britt and uh, Keith uh, helped us decide that, in fact, she has a CARD-14 mutation as pityriasis ruba pilaris caused by that. Um, but these results uh, really uh, were the things that uh, uh, cemented my interest in following patients who had ichthyosis uh, as uh, they were getting such a good result from this, this drug. In retrospect, um, I think that this multi-center study had another benefit, and that I, I think in fact was, it was, the, it was the, the vehicle for creating the foundation for ichthyosis-related skin types, which at that time was called the Ichthyosis Foundation. Um, at, before this, this pharmaceutical trial started, most dermatologists who saw ichthyosis patients did so in the context of a busy practice. They'd see dozens of patients with acne and psoriasis and one patient with, with uh, ichthyosis, if they saw any patients with ichthyosis. Uh, but what this trial did uh, is it forced uh, physicians to start grouping their patients because it made it much easier to see them as a group. Not only did it help with that trial, but it helped to teach residents about what the ichthyosis was like because instead of just learning about it from a textbook, you could actually see a group of patients who had this disease. Uh, and th that was really an advantageous uh, event for uh, the, the, the uh, clinical community. But at the same time, there were two moms who were talking in Mary Williams' office, uh, uh, Pam Brown and uh, Barbara Landwehr, uh, 
uh, and they realized that they were learning things from each other about the social and uh, emotional and even practical aspects of, of dealing with ichthyosis uh, and talking to adults like Reed and Tannis who had successfully navigated a life with ichthyosis, uh, that they had a lot to offer each other. And so those two women started the Foundation for Ichthyosis in, in 1980. Um, and, and, it, and I think the, uh, this trial of this one drug for, was a, uh, a critical way that, that forced that to get going. So the, the, uh, found, the Ichthyosis Foundation was founded, and I think the physicians who were participating in the, tri in the trial realized that this was an important uh, addition to what they could offer patients. And so very quickly, Lowell Goldsmith uh, organized a group of physicians to form a medical advisory board for the Ichthyosis Foundation, and, and that's how I got involved. Uh, because the, the physicians were really quite enthusiastic about uh, helping this organization thrive, and I think that's been something that's been uh, important for many, many years. Now, personally, uh, when I talk to residents, I tell them, or young medical students, I say, when you get involved with a foundation, a uh, patient support foundation, you always get more out of it than you give. I mean, it's remarkable how much I've gotten out of my association, and that's why I've done this for so many years. And the kinds of things that I think have been really important uh, for me is that I've met a remarkable group of resilient people. These are people who solve problems, who uh, are wonderful with each other, uh, and this refers not only to the patients and the families, but also the staff and the people who have been involved with uh, leading the organization, uh, and, and also my colleagues who have, many of whom have been doing this along with me for many years. Uh, it's helped me refocus my thinking about what's important, not only in medicine, but also in my life as an investigator. Uh, it's forced me to learn new techniques as the, the foundation has raised questions that I needed to uh, learn how to answer. Um, and and uh, quite surprisingly, it took me a number of years to realize that, realize this. Uh, I never, I, I always loved research. I never realized how important research was to people who had incurable diseases. So the foundation has been very important in my life. Um, and the first thing that I thought would be important for me to study as an investigator was uh, desquamation, the shedding of scales from the skin, because that's really what the retinoids were doing. They were, the most obvious thing they were doing was uh, making the scale less obvious. So this is a quick little summary of what happens. Uh, and this is a diagram of the epidermis where the proliferating cells are down here in the basal layer. The cells differentiate slowly over a couple of weeks. They form a stratum corneum. Uh, and after another couple of weeks, a billion cells a day are shed or desquamated from the surface. Ah, thank you. It still is not working. I can't get to the arrow. Let's try this. All right. We won't use it. Okay. Um, so here's what, um, now many people had known that, that that renewal process of desquamating cells was greatly accelerated in ichthyosis, three or four times what was normal, and so more cells were being shed from the surface. But when you look at the surface, you see that the, the layer of those dead cells looks thicker, you have scale, and when you look at a histologic section of the, the skin, this would be normal skin, and this is ichthyosis skin, you immediately see that this layer, the stratum corneum, is the one thing that's obviously different in ichthyosis than it is in normal, and it's different not only in its thickness, but also the way it stains by this particular stain. So it's qualitatively different as well. So the question was, how do you study this? How do you study this process of losing cells? And so 
Uh, I was lucky to go into dermatology at a time when people had just learned how to culture keratinocytes in a very effective way. And so we learned how to do this, uh, and we studied what retinoids would do to a, an artificial tissue in the bottom of a petri dish. You'd let the cells grow and form a three-dimensional epithelium, and then you'd throw in some extra retinoid. We used retinoic acid and isotretinoin to see what would happen. And this is what the normal epidermis would look like. This is about six layers of cells. And this is an electron micrograph, so everything is a little bit more compressed than it would have been in that uh, um, other histologic section I showed you. And when we added the retinoid, there's still uh, layers of cells, but you see pretty normal, uh, you see these larger spaces between the cells. And what was happening if we actually counted the cells over a couple of month period of time, this dark spot is what the normal culture would be. When you added the retinoids, you got a dose response. A little bit of retinoid increased the amount of cells that were shed. A lot of retinoid increased it even more. And so more cells are shed. Well, if more cells are shed, why do you still have the thickness? Well, you have the thickness because the, the cells don't have enough time to mature, and so they do stick together. And so this question of why are the cells sticking together was uh, really uh, intriguing me. And so I looked at these things and I said, well, maybe there's some, maybe it, the retinoids are affecting the glue between the cells. Uh, and at that time, not much was known about what retinoids did biochemically. What they actually were thought to do was increase the amount of sugars on proteins. So I went and looked for proteins that were in keratinocytes that had lots of sugars on them. Uh, I spent 10 years doing this. I found a, a very large proteoglycan that we called epican that actually made cells stick together a little bit, but they were unaffected by retinoids. So this is, this is one of the things that happens with science. You ask a good question, you do some good experiments, you come up with a result, but it doesn't answer the question you asked. So, <laughs> it happens all the time. Um, and I, this is, I'm only going to tell you one story like that. Uh, uh, what we do know now uh, 30 years later, we do have a lot of information. I overlooked the fact that these little dark spots are desmosomes. They're much smaller here than they are here. And retinoids do affect uh, desmosome formation. This is a, de this is a very high electric electron micrograph uh, of an epithelial cell with the desmosomes and keratin filaments. And I was looking at what was here, but I should have been looking here. What we know now is that retinoids not only decrease the proteins that are in these desmosomes, they increase the enzymes that digest the desmosomes as they move into the stratum corneum. So everything gets loosened and the cells fall off more rapidly. So the, 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 uh, the number of cells being produced is about the same, but the, the stratum corneum gets thinner. And that's why you see this nice result uh, for, about on scaling from using retinoids. Uh, now, besides the scale that we all can see, reducing the thickness of the stratum corneum has a few other effects. Even in areas that don't have obvious scale, the stratum corneum is thick. It makes hands and, and feet stiff, less pliable. Uh, and, and in this case, this woman has a constriction here. This is called pseudoanum. And when you give her the retinoid, a lot of this, her hand become more supple and that pseudoanum disappears. Um, Britt Craiglow also showed that if you take a topical retinoid and put it on eyelids of people who have ichthyosis, you remove the stratum corneum and therefore make the lid more supple. And the ectropion that many people with ichthyosis have gets better. This happens, doesn't happen with everybody, but it happens with a significant number of people. So retinoids reduce stratum corneum thickness, and that's good for people with ichthyosis. Now, if you're a good physician, you need to worry about side effects from drugs. And, and everybody knew that uh, too much vitamin A uh, was not good. And the, and the reason it wasn't good is that although vitamin A is important for the normal growth and development of bones, uh, too much of it makes bones weak. 
And the synthetic retinoids were actually developed to have less effect on bones than they had on the skin. And that's definitely true. But early in that uh, Roach study, I was unfortunate to uh, have one young man who was taking four milligrams uh, per kilogram of uh, isotretinoin uh, develop a fused epiphysis, which is the growth plate in a, in a long bone. Um, so I had to become an expert in retinoid effects on bones. And, and basically, we learned two important things. One is that there are, <clears throat> there are retinoid effects that are permanent, and there are retinoid effects that are reversible. The permanent ones are things like fused epiphysis fused epiphyses. Um, we almost never see them in dermatology anymore. People who, who get retinoids for ichthyosis or for acne don't fuse their epiphyses because they never go up to four milligrams per kilogram. Uh, what people on retinoids do get are calcified ligaments. Now, we all get calcified ligaments, but people who are on retinoids will get the calcified ligaments maybe er sooner uh, or slightly more extensive, but most of these <clears throat> are asymptomatic. They may lead to a little bit of stiffness, but many are asymptomatic. Uh, and I now have many patients who've been on retinoids for 40 years, going almost 45 years, um, who are having no trouble at all. In fact, have no calcifications. I have one man who has no calcifications. He's as old as I am, which is pretty remarkable because uh, I have lots. <clears throat> so these are the permanent things. The, the reversible things are the osteopenia. And this is, this is why too much vitamin A causes broken bones. Uh, and early on, we showed that if you give um, isotretinoin to young, healthy men for acne, their bone density goes down significantly. But if you look at these people several years later, their bone densities come back to normal. Uh, and in fact, the bone is a very homeostatic system, and there are lots of feedback mechanisms that make things that, uh, correct abnormalities. And I have never had, I don't think anybody who's followed anybody on long-term retinoids uh, has had problems with uh, osteoporotic fractures. Uh, so I think, although this was a theoretical possibility, it's turned out that um, these are, and the, the, the effect on osteopenia is reversible. Okay, now let's just turn uh, to how FIRST evolved from becoming just an advocate for research to a participant in research. <clears throat> from, the, from, from its inception, the Ichthyosis Foundation and the Medical Advisory Board would go to Washington every year um, to, to lobby for, for more money from, from the government for the NIH. And many of us had, had grants from the NIH. <clears throat> uh, and we were happy to do this, but most of those grants had to do with laboratory research, like I was showing you. Um, and in the early 2000s, uh, I was at one of these sessions with Gene Pickford, and the two of us said, you know, there really ought to be more money that is going to uh, patient-focused research for ichthyosis. Um, how are we going to do that? So, we planned a few things. Now, one thing that had happened prior to this, uh, well, let's, oh, I can do this, was that there was an ichthyosis registry in Seattle. Um, this was, at this time, this wasn't, it was hoped that w this would promote research, but it didn't actually promote a lot of research, and it was very difficult to get people to enroll. Uh, the NIH funded it for a long time, and about the time Gene and I were in Washington, the funding for this registry had been withdrawn. Uh, so we decided that one thing we would do was we would write a big grant. There was a proposal for writing grants for uh, disease, rare diseases, and a, we got together a group of people, all these people I think you recognize, many are in the room, um, and uh, we wrote this big consortium grant, which didn't get funded. Another thing that happens in research all the time. But what it did was it sort of set an agenda. We all agreed that it was important for us to work together on uh, patient-focused research, do basic research in the laboratory, and try to merge the things along with the 
the patient community and get first to be involved with this. You can see Gene was a, an important consultant there. Um, we actually wrote another grant in uh, 2013, which also didn't get funded, but it, it improved the agenda that we had set. And a lot of the studies that many of you participated in this weekend um, were, were thought of and described in that grant at that time. Uh, and at that time, that grant, we had added a few people like Keith Choate uh, and a few others. Um, but we also had, at that time, five, 10 years later, much better technology to think about. And so that was very critical in what's happening this, this weekend at this meeting. Now, the other thing that we did to promote research uh, that was important for FIRST was at the 2010 Family Conference, uh, we preceded that conference with what was called the, uh, the Frontiers in Ichthyosis Research. And this was an international group of ichthyosis experts who came to talk about how you get patient-funded, uh, patient-focused research going. And one of the things, you can see Dave Scholl back here, uh, he had this idea that uh, uh, we ought to have ambassadors uh, from the, the uh, first community who would help us encourage people to become involved in research. And I think that actually has happened. I know that in the project that I did this weekend, um, one, of, one of our good uh, patients here was worried that I wasn't getting enough people enrolled in the study, so she started calling up her friends. And we enrolled a couple of extra people because Diana Gilbert decided to help me out. Uh, and that's really important to have uh, people involved like that. Uh, so I think at this point, clearly, re research was important for FIRST. FIRST, in 2006, decided they would actually fund some grants. Uh, those grants went to a lot of different people uh, throughout the United States, and some of them were international grants. A lot of them were for laboratory research. Some were for patient-focused research. And as the research uh, effort built, uh, there was more interest in finding out, well, how was this organization first reaching the people who might be interested in what was going on? Um, and we had one data, one, one president, uh, Jeff Hurl, who loved data. I'm sorry Jeff isn't here to hear this, because Jeff kept pushing me for, how come we don't know how many people have ichthyosis? If we don't know how many people have ichthyosis, how can we evaluate how good the foundation is doing? Um, so at one board meeting, uh, I just got tired of hearing it. I left the room and I called up my niece, who was a, uh, a data analyst for Thomson Reuters, and she told me that there were databases that we could use to actually answer this question, and so we did. Um, we looked at databases that represent 150 million people in the United States. These are three different databases, uh, and we reasoned that there's one ICD-9 code, which is the code that physicians use for reimbursement. There's only one code for ichthyosis, and it's very hard to uh, confuse ichthyosis with anything else at birth, and we decided that with that anybody who got an ICD-9 code of 7.7.757 would, would, during the first year of life, would probably have bona fide ichthyosis. So we looked for that code, and in fact, across these three databases, over a 10-year period of time, there was a pretty consistent number of people who were given that diagnosis. And the numbers were these. Basically, they told us that there would be 270 new cases a year in the United States, and that there should be 22,000 total cases in the United States. And this was in, uh, two, uh, in 2010. Now, um, at that time, there were 1,000 people in FIRST, 1,000 affected individuals who were members of FIRST. And so Jeff asked, where are the other 21,000? How come we're not serving them? Uh, now, I'm going to go back one step further, is that uh, prior to Jeff and Dave, uh, Laura Phillips was president of the organization. And 
She and her husband ran a, hosted a website called uh, ichthyosis.com. And when she was president, she tried to get the organization to get much more interested. She wasn't the only one. The C's were, were all over this. They, to get the organization much more interested in, in using social media to reach out to people. Uh, I have to admit, I was sort of a slow adapter here. But when these, but when these data came out uh, and, the, and, and first decided to push social media as part of its uh, agenda for uh, helping people with ichthyosis, an enormous change happened. Because in the last 10 years, there had gone from 1,000 people who are members of FERC and, and affected to 9,000. So that's quite a dramatic increase uh, in a short period of time. So thank goodness for social media and for data that uh, uh, convinced me that it's worthwhile. Uh, now I'm going to turn to how FIRST became a driver for genetic diagnosis. <clears throat> Uh, and how that uh, impacted uh, me and my group at Yale. So this also has a really important first connection. Uh, and, and, and the personal relationships that I've developed here have really, in, in many ways, impacted my research career. The story begins 20 years ago uh, when uh, at a family conference, Mary Williams came up to me and said, you know, Len, I wish you could figure out what's going on with Haley Rice. Um, and I decided that uh, at that time, because Donna had done such a wonderful job of turning the organization from basically a mom and pop kind of uh, a patient support group to an organization that had bylaws and regular meetings and uh, fundraising and boards, uh, that she really turned this into a, an important organization that I, I, would, I would take this on. Uh, it, it didn't hurt that I had just seen two other paper patients who had a problem that looked similar to Haley's. Uh, but it was really Donna, my, my uh, relationship with Donna and my respect for her involvement with FIRST that, that drove me to uh, undertake this problem that seemed insoluble. So let me tell you about it. Um, Haley had white spots on her skin. This was a, a problem that had been described in 1990 in the French. They called it ictios en confetti. Uh, and everybody who had, there had been some progress and then extra reports about this problem uh, over 20 years, but nobody actually noticed that these white spots were normal. And when I looked at this, this photograph uh, of this young lady, um, having taken a, a digital image of it, I blew the di digital image up, and much to my surprise, those white spots, which I guess nobody else had looked at very carefully, looked like normal skin. Um, and I had just read this report that uh, in another skin disease called uh, epidermolysis bullosa, there were reports that uh, some disease skin reverted. The gene, there was revertant mosaicism, the gene that was affected uh, got better by some mysterious um, mechanism, and that's why the, norm, the skin looked normal. So we, we uh, collected a few more patients and uh, had this hypothesis that these white spots arose through revertant mosaicism. But the problem was we didn't know what the gene was that was causing this disease. And in order to prove that something is revertant mosaicism, you have to know the gene, you have to be able to sequence it. So this is now, uh, oh, and this is, this is how I got clued into this. So this was a young man who I saw in 1999. I thought he had uh, CIE. When I saw him several years later, he had these white spots. And it made me realize that these white spots were acquired. They weren't part of the disease. And somehow, nobody had really noticed that before. So this is, summarizes 10 years of work. Um, and, and it's still going on. Uh, and it starts with those fir first few patients. It really starts with Donna Rice and her daughter, a couple of more patients. Uh, and there was a resident in our program, Michelle Mack, who uh, looked at these patients with me, did histology on these patients, 
and, and notice that, in fact, the areas that were white looked like normal skin. They had this normal basket weave kind of a image instead of the compacted stratum corneum. Uh, so that looked pretty good as something that was reverting back to normal. Um, shortly after she did this, Keith Choate became a resident at Yale. Uh, and he had done his, his PhD with Rick Lifton, who was the head of uh, genetics at Yale. Uh, and uh, I think uh, I convinced Keith that this was an interesting problem to try to solve. Uh, but I didn't know how to get at the gene, and so we took this information to his mentor, Rick Lifton, who said, well, this is loss of heterozygosity, like happens in certain cancers. All you have to do is consider that each one of these white spots is an independent event, and you do classic genetics to identify where the gene is. And within a very short time, Keith did that. He showed that, in fact, on chromosome 7, there was revertant mosaicism. Uh, and that was great, but that left a lot of genes to look at. And it took four years before he actually identified the gene that was there. And it was really technology, I think, that uh, enabled him to do that. Because every time a new technology came out for sequencing genes, he tried it. And finally, using exome sequencing, he identified the keratin 10 and keratin 1 as the cause as the cause of the ichthyosis in these people, and, and then could rapidly demonstrate that uh, there was this mitotic recombination that was causing the revertent mosaicism. Uh, this is driving me nuts. All right, well, this turned out to be, you know, in that struggle that Keith had in in doing the sequencing turned out to be a benefit not only for him, but for FIRST. Because at that time, um, Dave Scholl was the president of the organization. Now, Dave was very savvy about technology, having had a, uh, a viral diagnostic company. And sort of the same way Jeff pushed me for how many ichthyosis patients there were, uh, Dave kept pushing and saying, why can't we use all this new technology for sequencing genes to give people a genetic diagnosis? And uh, um, it turned out that it can be done. And it turned out that uh, he encouraged FIRST to start funding Keith's efforts to give genetic diagnoses to everybody who has ichthyosis. And I think over the last 10 years, that's been a, a very productive uh, uh, combination. Now, why is early genetic diagnosis important? Well, the first reason is prognosis. Uh, when, a, when a baby is delivered with ichthyosis, a collodion baby, for example, um, most of the doctors who are taking care of these babies have a clue about maybe even the diagnosis, and certainly even with the diagnosis, they don't know what the prognosis is. And even those of us who are sophisticated don't know what to say because most people have a good prognosis, but there are some recessive ichthyoses which have a more guarded prognosis because they have other problems besides their scaly skin. So that's the baby who has collodion membrane. And uh, you know we, we have watchful waiting, and we can't be careful unless we have a good diagnosis. But if we get a good diagnosis, then we can prognosticate much better. Now, I want to give you a little story that was told to me by Ann Kyer, who has lamellar ichthyosis. Was a, is a, an emeritus professor of English from Penn State, um, and has written extensively now about her experiences with ichthyosis. When she was born in the 1940s, um, her parents were told that they should leave her in the hospital to die. Um, and, and she did some research about what the situation was then, and discovered that 25% of people born with ichthyosis at that time did die. Uh, clearly, that doesn't happen anymore. Those of us in the audience, uh, you know, we rarely see kids who are born with ichthyosis who die. Uh, and so clearly, something has changed. 
Uh, and, and actually, there are a lot of things that have changed, and that's what I want to talk a little bit about. Uh, but let's start with this. Um, this, is, this is to give us a clue. Uh, this is a child with harlequin ichthyosis. Um, and in 19, up until 1980, and I think uh, this morning Hunter gave you a, a, some insight into this, up until 1980 it was thought that all infants with harlequin ichthyosis did die. And in fact, um, starting in 1980, there were survivors. Uh, Initially, it was thought that maybe there were survivors because of the use of retinoids, but now many of us have seen harlequin infants who survive without the, ret the use of retinoids. And so the question is, what's changed if it isn't the retinoids? Why are these kids surviving? And there are a bunch of reasons, but they're, here are the important ones. First of all, we understand what the important role of the stratum corneum is. It's a barrier to water loss, and if you don't have a good barrier to water loss, you get dehydrated very quickly. Uh, and if you try to mimic ichthyosis in an experimental animal, uh, most of those experimental animals do die within hours of birth because of dehydration. So just knowing that allows you to be very careful about rehydrating babies and putting emollients on so that their barrier is at least partially restored. It's very important. But the, the next thing that's really important is the advent of newborn special care units. I'm not sure that any, any of you in the audience appreciate the fact that this common uh, thing that people find in the hospital now really wasn't started until the 1960s and wasn't adopted uh, widely throughout the United States until well into the 70s. But Almost all hospitals now have a special unit for newborns who need special care. And in those units, a lot of things happen besides good hydration and monitoring for infections. Um, it's, it's the time when parents get support, uh, and it's also the time you know, and the place uh, for, for people to, to learn about their disease. Uh, Perhaps equally, and so newborn special, special care units do make a big difference. And if you are in a first world country, near, anywhere near a hospital, and you have ichthyosis, you're born with ichthyosis, you have a good chance of surviving. But the other important thing is the fact that uh, I think in the last 50 years has become much broader social acceptance of disabilities. Uh, I think in the 40s when Ann Kyer was born, things were very different. Uh, they're much different now in terms of social acceptability, and organizations like FIRST have played a big role in that. Okay, are any types of ichthyosis lethal? Well, I would say they should not be if you're close to a good hospital. Uh, but in the case of some syndromic forms, recessive forms of ichthyosis, we must have a much more guarded prognosis. And I'm going to give you one example of why early genetic diagnosis can make a, a significant difference. Um, so this infant was uh, seen at our hospital and died at five months of age. He had kid syndrome. Kid syndrome is not generally thought to be a lethal disease. Uh, but Evelyn Lilly, Dr. Lilly, who is here, took care of this patient and did an extensive uh, literature search to find out other people who with kid syndrome had died in the neonatal period and discovered that in fact the ones who had died all had one of two mutations. This is, a, this is a gene that has a dozen mutations in it, but there were only two mutations that had been reported to have this lethal outcome. Uh, Gappy Richard working at GeneDx uh, knows this disease very well and she has her own database and she had never seen, she had never diagnosed a kid syndrome a patient who had lived beyond the year, first year of life. This child was, uh, caring for this child was, uh, despite heroic efforts, he died. Um, the, it was very difficult for the family and for the people taking care of him. And if there had been an early genetic diagnosis for him, there probably could have been some decisions that were different than the ones that were made. And that's clearly one reason to get early genetic diagnosis. 
Okay, I think you all know about the importance of family planning. Um, all I have to do is remind you about that, that uh, young boy who I diagnosed with CIE who turned out to have uh, confetti ichthyosis, which is a dominant disease, or quite a few of those people who were told they only had a one in four chance of having another affected child, and so there are a number of families with confetti ichthyosis uh, who have multiple members of one generation with that problem, and that's because they didn't have early diagnosis. Now, they may have had more children anyway, but at least the information would have been better if they had had early, di uh, early genetic information. And the thing I want to find, uh, finish up with is targeted therapy. Um, if you don't know the gene and you don't know the protein, it's hard to figure out how to come up with a therapy that is different from an emollient or a retinoid, which doesn't act on particular genes. Um, <clears throat> and so I want to start by reminding you that all genetic diseases are caused by proteins that either are abnormal or work in ways that uh, they shouldn't work. Uh, but making diagnoses from proteins is extremely difficult. It's much easier, especially now, to give somebody a diagnosis genetically. But once you know what the gene is, you then know what the RNA is, and you know what the protein is. And you can target therapies at the gene or the RNA or the protein. Um, so we're going to talk just a little bit about this um, because it brings me back to uh, one of the things that I started out with in my research career and has become increasingly interesting to me, and that's keratins. Keratins make up 20% of the, uh, the protein in the skin. Uh, and when I started out, I wanted to know more about keratins, just like a lot of people did. So I went to the slaughterhouse and got a bunch of different tissues and was fortunate to find that uh, the esophagus in the cow, which is very similar to the epidermis, had only two keratins. And other people were working with skin and other parts of the, the, uh, the integument, and they were finding many, many keratins. And, and I was able to isolate these two proteins, which I called E1 and E2, uh, and then recombine them, and they would make filaments that look like the filaments that are the tonofilaments in the keratinocyte. Um, and these happen to be an acidic keratin and a basic keratin. Uh, and so this allowed us to suggest that the keratin filament had a basic structure, which was a, a dimer, a heterodimer, that it had two strands, two strands like DNA, as opposed to three strands like collagen. Uh, now, Peter, Peter Steiner, who clearly was the best protein chemist who ever set foot in dermatology, uh, didn't like that hypothesis. He thought it was going to be a three-stranded molecule. But it turned out that this was one of the first clues that it was really going to be a two-stranded molecule. Um, at the time, however, there were no diseases that were associated with keratins, and so I moved on. But in the last... 20 years, 25 years, I've come back to keratins, and some of them you'll know about. So one of the big problems with keratins was that, so you knew that there was this dimer, this heterodimer, but what you didn't know was these dimers had to assemble laterally so that they would form these filaments called intermediate filaments. And at the time, people didn't know whether they lined up in parallel or whether they lined up in an anti-parallel fashion. Uh, and not only that, they didn't know what held them together, and they didn't know whether they were exactly in alignment or whether they were staggered. And this was a problem that Peter Steiner worked on, Howard Baden worked on, lots of people worked on, and it couldn't be solved. We were lucky in New Haven because a, a young man came as a resident uh, who had experience in X-ray crystallography, uh, and when he was nearing the end of his residency, he said, he asked me, you know, what, are the, what protein should I be working on if I want to continue my career as a crystallographer? I said, keratins. It's the hardest problem. Nobody's been able to solve it. Uh, well, Chris Bunick did. Um, he went to Tom Stites' laboratory, uh, and he demonstrated that, in fact, you can get uh, an alignment 
and I'll just show you this. This, this is the, these are two keratin dimers, an acidic and a basic. And when they align, they align in an anti-parallel fashion, in a staggered fashion. And the reason this happens is that there is a, a knob on one end of this part of the molecule that inserts into a pocket on the opposite strand. Uh, I, I can't overemphasize how important this discovery is to sort of the basic science of understanding this most abundant protein in the skin. And early in his career, Chris was actually supported by a grant from FIRST, uh, which is very important. And he gives him credit all the time. Chris has now gone on uh, to uh, treat, he, he's involved with several uh, therapeutic trials for diseases of keratin, as well as other ichthyosis diseases. So He's, he's part of us now. Now, I had one, I'm going to give you one final thing that I was uh, fortunately involved with. There's another disease that could be represented at, in first, but uh, uh, the found, their, this foundation decided to split off the Pachynichia congenita foundation. Uh, these people have calluses on their feet, and they have thickened nails. And the disease is caused by keratins. It's caused by keratin-6 or keratin-16. Uh, those are the common keratins that cause this disease. And uh, in the late 1990s, uh, again, technology sort of drives research. In the late 1990s, it was found that there are things called small interfering RNA that can degrade keratins. Uh, that can degrade, I mean, get, that can degrade other RNAs. And this Pachynichia Congenita Foundation decided it was going to support research in using these small interfering RNAs to get rid of the bad protein that was being expressed in the skin of these people. Uh, so a small group of people worked on this for a while, and one patient uh, was put into a trial where the small interfering RNA was injected into the skin to see what would happen to the callus. And I was fortunate to be part of the trial. And just briefly, what happened was this trial lasted 115 days. Um, and this is, this is the uh, inner part of the right foot at the beginning of the trial. This is 115 days later where the medicine was injected here. This is the left foot where the injection occurred without any change in the callus. And so this was actually the first proof of principle that this kind of therapy could be useful for treating what we call a dominant negative disease, a disease in which if you eliminate a protein because you've eliminated the RNA that makes it, uh, you can improve the disease. Unfortunately, the injections of this medicine are very painful. Um, and this is not gone anywhere yet, although there are some developments uh, for delivering nucleic acids that could make the future for this kind of therapy bright. Um, one quick thing, people have asked me about this microbiome business. Uh, and this final ichthyosis-related project that I got involved with was, again, quite fortuitous. Uh, there were two students at Yale, uh, Azeem Munavar and Travis Whitfield. Uh, Azeem was a medical student. Travis was a, an, an early uh, uh, research assistant who came to me uh, and said, listen, we want to engineer bacteria that are normally living on the skin to produce proteins that the skin isn't making and therefore cure ichthyosis. And the two target diseases that they wanted to cure were ichthyosis vulgaris. They wanted to make filagrin. And Netherton's, they wanted to make the, the missing or the abnormal protein Lecti. Lecti. Um, and I said to them, I, I, think, I don't think this is going to work. It's very hard to get things into the skin. But they kept coming back to me, and they kept having better data. Uh, and they had this good idea, and they were very entrepreneurial. So they formed a company, and they called the company Azetra. Uh, so there's this company that I'm still a, an advisor to. But the interesting part of this story was that uh, they needed another advisor, and that was someone who was a, an expert in the microbiome. Um, and 
that person is Julia O, oh, who's at the Jackson Laboratories uh, that's affiliated with the uh, University of Connecticut. And she's a microbiome expert. Uh, and after sitting through boring meetings for many months, I said to her, you know, you and I have uh, expertise that's complementary, and we can ask an ecological question. If you change the soil in which bacteria are living on the skin, do you change the bacteria? If you take one gene and you make it uh, abnormal, does that change the bacteria that live on the skin? And so we put together a proposal. This was a proposal that the NIH actually was happy to fund, uh, and that's why many of you participated in this uh, uh, this project where we're looking at five different genotypes to find out uh, how one mutant gene would make a difference. And I'll just show you a little bit of preliminary data. It's pretty easy to tell. Just look at the colors. Um, these are control people, and what we're looking at here are just the staphylococcal species. This includes Staph aureus as well as the many different kinds of Staph epidermidis that are on, that are on the skin. And these are the normal people, 10 different locations. They don't have a lot of different kinds of staph on their skin. Uh, and these are people who have transglutaminase 1 type lamellar ichthyosis. And you can see not only are the colors different, but they're there in different amounts. So there is clearly a difference. And this is a difference that doesn't occur in another disease called Darié disease. Now, we don't have enough data to actually tell you specific kinds of uh, staff that are present or anything more than that, but this could eventually be quite interesting. And the reason it could be quite interesting is that some of these normal bacteria actually make components that increase the barrier. Um, this is fairly recent information that didn't come from me, it didn't come from Julia. Uh, uh, it came from Dr. Greiner at the University of Pennsylvania. But to think about bacteria that actually doing something positive to the skin is pretty exciting. So that's one of the things that has kept me going over the last several years. These are the, uh, the areas where my interests have merged with uh, the interests of FIRST and the ichthyosis community. Uh, this has been an, a, a great opportunity for me to meet people who are very stimulating. A lot of these people are my friends, um, and I enjoy being with them all the time. These are the leaders of the organization over the many years. It certainly doesn't include uh, the other people who are on the board. Many of them were also my friends who were devoted to the organization. Uh, it doesn't include the, the wonderful people that have worked in the office. Um, these are some of the physicians who have had the opportunity, and scientists I've had the opportunity to work with. And uh, we would have these meetings at the uh, American Academy of Dermatology meeting where we would look at problem cases. Uh, and it was not very high tech. We'd have my laptop there or somebody's laptop there, and we'd look at cases. And that was about the, clinical, the amount of clinical research that was going on. Uh, in ichthyosis 25 years ago. And finally, uh, being involved with FIRST has given me the opportunity to meet a lot of you uh, and to read the saggy baggy elephant to a lot of the kids. That's it. <laughs>